Right, so uh, good morning, uh, good, sorry, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this uh, webinar uh, on uh, uh, technologies um, supported by NGI projects around the DNS and naming technology. Special thanks to the uh, the uh, panelists that enthusiastic, uh, enthusiastically accepted to join. Um, a bit of uh, logistic, if you are not planning to speak, please uh, um, uh, leave the audio. Uh, and uh, if, if you don't plan to uh, and turn off your camera as well, uh, there will be uh, possibilities for the audience to ask questions, primarily through the chat. So please, um, please use this. And we, we, we have Stefano. Uh, hello, Stefano. I don't know if he's around, but Stefano will. Um, I, sorry, I, I forgot to, to press another big blue button. Uh, Stefano will um, uh, take the questions uh, from, uh, from, from everybody, uh, panelists and, and people uh, watching. Uh, I would like to say that this uh, is hosted by uh, and organized by Mikael Lennartz from uh, uh, NLNet. And big thanks to, to you, Mikael, uh, as well as contribution from uh, the NGI projects uh, that, uh, that we are funding. One little word of introduction on NGI. So Next Generation Internet is a program uh, incubated uh, some uh, four years ago already now. Uh, with full operation uh, in, in 19 and 20. Today we have uh, like uh, 400 projects uh, with uh, gathering uh, around 1,000 people, 1,000 innovators. <clears throat> the uh, initial idea and the idea of the uh, NGI is to, um, to make sure we have an internet that is along the line of some of the value that in Europe we commonly share. Uh, in terms of privacy, in terms of uh, openness, in terms of collaboration across border, uh, in terms of transparency, uh, inclusiveness. Uh, and this uh, was the, the driving uh, force for um, uh, designing this program. Uh, and uh, another important element is that this program was meant to attract people that are not commonly associated with uh, EC projects. Uh, namely, open source communities, uh, independent uh, contributors, uh, small companies with uh, um, minimizing uh, red tape for joining, uh, and, um, and of course, based on excellence. Uh, that means uh, today uh, we channel the money through intermediaries. So the money from Commission goes to uh, uh, consortia that in turn select the, the projects. Um, and as I mentioned, we have a lot of them. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's because of the nature of the program uh, that is uh, meant to drive the evolution of the internet. Uh, we have some uh, very important projects supporting evolution of, of the DNS uh, and other naming technologies in other contexts. Uh, and uh, uh, we have quite uh, a number of them. And today, uh, again, thanks to the uh, effort from uh, the coordinator of the uh, of the NGI projects, we have um, uh, a very uh, interesting panel of uh, of six. Uh, well, actually, it's eight projects, uh, and we will have uh, six panelists presenting these eight projects. There are others, but uh, these one are uh, really um, the one addressing some of the core element of. Uh, of the naming technology. And if we step back a little bit um, as an introduction words, uh, it's it's clearly a, a key, an essential piece of uh, uh, of the internet architecture uh, as the, um, the way to uh, make uh, IP addresses understandable and the way to uh, allow people to interact with the internet, as, as we, we all know, Internet uh, protocol IP was designed to move data from one basically interface to the other one, and then TCP to demultiplex the ones the application above. But uh, obviously, it was not meant for a human uh, understanding. And uh, from the initial day, there was uh, ways to combine human understandable uh, name to this IP. It was initially a file. Uh, centrally organized and distributed, the famous host uh, doc 
TXT, but uh, very early uh, within the, the internet community and, and, and in, inside IATF, uh, there was a development for designing a technology. And that's why uh, the community designed uh, the DNS, so <clears throat> everything related to uh, uh, the software, the, the design of the root servers, the domain, the subdomain, and as well as the, the organization of the associated uh, administration. So uh, the TLDs, the ICANN, uh, the registrars uh, for the domain, the registries, or registrants, and also the associated standards. So um, if you look at the, uh, uh, the RFC related to uh, in DNS, there are many, many of them. Uh, few dozens for sure and and we have today some of the contributors to these uh, uh, standards uh, here in the panel so it's um, it's it's very important for us to understand how those things are evolving and how uh, ngi is um, is helping uh, some of these developments uh, from policy point of view there are clear um, uh, needs or uh, impact in relation to the resilience uh, the privacy uh, today, we are talking about anti-abuse, uh, link with identity, for instance. Uh, these are subjects that were not initially uh, important in the original design of the uh, of the DNS. And in over time, uh, that explains why we had um, many, many additional features, notably in the area of security and privacy. So some may say, well, we have a complex system and uh, uh, let's use it. And we'll have today some example of how to bootstrap trust using DNS. Some will say this needs consolidation. So we have also projects that enables additional uh, robustness in terms of, for instance, security. And some will say, well, it's too complex. Let's do other things. And we have here a stream of, uh, uh, of development coming from the peer-to-peer -peer world and new cryptography uh, and also uh, block technologies uh, that can be also uh, very uh, interesting, that are very interesting. So that's uh, uh, the objective of, the, of this of this webinar is really for uh, for our parties to to present their uh, their developments uh, not only for the audience but also for uh, between themselves because there are some interesting uh, aspects of uh, spillover from one project to another one uh, let's not reinvent the wheel for instance complementarity synergies and also um, it's important not to uh, uh, well to understand if there are any uh, uh, any any overlap, for instance. Uh, so that's that's one objective. One other objective is to link with some of our uh, policies. So if there are any policy implication that will be uh, important to understand, uh, we will we have colleagues from uh, uh, internet governance uh, in uh, in our remit. So it's uh, it's important to also. Uh, interact with them and, and maybe pass uh, some message uh, both uh, direction. Um, then, uh, yes, another objective is, of course, to uh, uh, with the audience to interact, and that will be the second part of of this uh, of this uh, webinar. That brings me to the to the agenda, and thanks, uh, uh, Michael, for putting it on the on the screen. Uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, six uh, uh, six panelists. Uh, Beno from uh, NNet Labs, uh, that uh, that is uh, is very famous for maintaining some essential part of uh, of the DNS infrastructure, and uh, Beno is uh, the managing director. Uh, Alexander from Open Exchange, that uh, is uh, uh, managing the evolution of some also other key products there. Uh, around Power DNS, and he will explain us uh, some of the uh, enhancements uh, plan inside some inside uh, their NGI project. Uh, Leif Johansson is also on the call. Thanks, Leif, for joining. Um, he's uh, uh, part of the core team of uh, Cryptech. So this is an open hardware effort that is. Uh, uh, supporting uh, hardening of uh, some key uh, function of the internet, and that can be an enabler for advanced 
uh, robustness of some uh, DNS server. Uh, Rick, uh, I'm not sure Rick is on the call. Well, we'll find out. Um, Rick from uh, is from Internet Wide, and he will uh, explain how we can uh, bootstrap some uh, uh, some application with using DNS technology. Uh, and we have two projects that are uh, exploring other uh, means and other naming technology. Uh, Christian uh, from uh, uh, Bern uh, University that will uh, explore a naming system for uh, GNU, GNUnet. And Jeremy from Namecoin organization that will explore some uh, uh, key developments uh, around uh, Namecoin. Uh, so with that, uh, I would suggest to proceed with the uh, with the agenda. Um, starting with you, Beno. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you are uh, managing and and and, compass and uh, uh, addressing some key challenges of the evolution of some of your projects. Uh, not not the DNS uh, and and uh, security. Um, and uh, as part of uh, NGI Zero Pet, uh, you have uh, two projects. Uh, so uh, you will be uh, you will present these two. Um, yep. I I don't know if you have the presenter right now. Yeah, I guess I you are right. Okay, thank well, you. Uh, good to see you. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. -Luc. Uh, so I did prepare two presentations, both of 10 minutes, but I did some uh, some some counting. <laughs> so I'm expected to do the presentation in 10 minutes. If you know me, you know, uh, I can talk for hours about DNS uh, and DNSSEC. So I will, uh, well, improvise and shorten my presentations. Um, first, we go to the DNSSEC key, key signing uh, suite. Uh, let's see. Uh, the this one. Oh, no, that's not the correct one. Um, all right, yeah, this one. Allow, okay. You see my screen. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not in presenting mode, but I think it's good enough. I don't know. Does this also work for you? Yes, good for me. Yeah, you see the not not the presenting, just the the the, the slides, not the presenting mode, presenters that, mode. Okay. That's fine. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thanks. So this this is the first project uh, that was funded by NGI, NGI Zero, the DNSSEC key ceremonies. Um, so DNSSEC has well, as especially on on the on the publication part, the signing of a zone has seen a wide adoption. Uh, I here sh show you an, uh, a map of the CCTLDs, the country's uh, top-level domain that has either signed an operation or has published an, uh, a DS a delegation uh, signature uh, in the route. So that's, that's, that's very good. For the generic top-level domains, all the new generic top-level domains are required to do DNSSEC. So uh, on the publication part, it's it's successful and you see great adoption. Um, but also uh, if you, well, these top level domains are of high value. So also the signing of this top level domain is also something that well, needs some care attention, careful attention and uh, strong key protection. So what we do see is we uh, most of these uh, TLDs, CC TLDs, G TLDs, they use an uh, an HSM, um, right? So that brings a number of well, kind of procedural and operational requirements. Um, so HSMs uh, typically for the in, well, increased security, you don't want to have the HSM connected with the internet. You want, and we call it air gapped. It's not connected, and even you want to store it in a vault or in a safe. Um, but be, having an HSM not connected to the internet, that means that you need a procedure um, to get your keys signed by the HSM. And we have different scenarios that either, uh, and, and without going into too much details here with uh, DNSSEC, uh, 
you can use DNSSEC with one key, but most of the top level domains use two keys, so-called key signing key, which is being really kept very, very safe, and the so-called zone signing keys. So the key signing key is signing the zone signing key. And the zone signing keys are in general uh, online and being used to sign zones. So how do we introduce uh, these keys uh, either into the vault getting them signed or getting also these keys outside the vault and back in our system. And that we called a ceremony. Um, a well-known uh, key ceremony is uh, organized by ICANN and is, uh, or organized by IENA slash ICANN. Uh, and that's the key signing ceremony for the DNS route. Uh, PCH, the packet clearing house, also has an, uh, a room and an infrastructure to, that, to do that for a number of CCTLDs they house, also with cameras and a well-documented uh, procedure. Um, let's slide. So, <clears throat> um, these key ceremonies, of course, well, uh, I just named two. Um, they talk about a process and some tooling. And the tooling was, uh, well, either of either, all these organizations make their, design their own tooling. And the goal of this uh, project was to kind of standardize these guidelines. And of course, everybody has different requirements, but if you have kind of a standardized guideline, you can pick and choose. So, so this is important for us, this is important, this not so much. So in this way, you have at least a, a good blueprint for a key ceremony so that other CCTLDs or GTLDs can choose to use this blueprint document and uh, organize or implement a key ceremony in their own organization. And of course, you also want to automate these ceremonies. So uh, in the end, you want to have uh, the, the, the tooling, you want to integrate that with your signing infrastructure. So you need some, some scripts and tooling. Um, good, for speed, um, Sorry, so, Benno, for interrupting, but I'm not sure we see your slide. We see the first slide. Is it normal? Oh, automation with recipes. Okay, let's go back to what we are stuck one? with. The, ah, yes, this we have not seen this one. Okay, sorry, sorry. So apparently, in in, in uh, presenters mode, uh, it's it's it keeps with uh, well. I'll oh, I'll stay okay. in this mode. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. As, so this was the ceremonies. Uh, okay, so this was the second slide I discussed. This is the th third slide. So, uh, oh no, I just also presented this one. Um, good. Um, yeah. What we have done is kind of, well, yeah, just having kind of a standard ceremony or a blueprint of ceremony. Uh, we can also start, uh, well, oh, implementing an automation tools and scripts to uh, support the ceremony and we call that uh, the output of uh, kind of of the input i have to say to the ceremony a recipe and this is a kind of this describes your uh, your procedure your key ceremony in a machine readable way um, with our tooling uh, we developed this will generate a kind of an, an, an uh, input for the well, we have to choose, of course, uh, uh, for for open DNSSEC input. So, so the the, the recipe is then translated by the tooling uh, as a script for the DNSSEC, sorry, open DNSSEC signer module. Um, and with in this way, uh, you can implement your recipe, your procedure. Uh, with the tooling and with the end product being being uh, input for your signing solution, uh, we are uh, one. We we develop OpenDNSSEC. So as a special use case, we integrated this in OpenDNSSEC signer. But we have made it also a number of assumptions. But nowadays these assumptions are quite generic. Uh, we we uh, uh, for example, uh, bind and also not DNS has similar concepts. 
So this can be easily translated to these, uh, well, if you choose to sign not DNS or bind as a signer, you can change a little bit in the scripts and then use that for, or maybe even one-on-one, -on -one, use that for your signing solution. But again, we uh, use it for our open DNSSEC signer. Um, this is future work. Well, of course, we are open for future, uh, for community feedback. Um, that's indeed a question. Uh, is this uh, recipe API something for the ITF to consider? It's a little bit operational, but it might be a good thing just to, to introduce it in the DNSOP working group and let's see what's the feedback. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's good to have this tool also working with other open source DNSSEC implementers. Um, we wrote also a blog about this work uh, on our, well, you see the reference. Um, and we publish uh, this, uh, let's see, uh, and the tools are uh, available and the recipe on GitHub on our uh, and on that labs github account so that's the key ceremony um, i will s stop sharing these slides and move on to the next presentation as soon as possible this one hello okay i will maximize this one yeah okay Okay, that, that works. So for um, the Connect by Name, the other project um, at NLN Labs, um, <clears throat> it's quite different. What's Connect by Name? Well, what does it mean to set up a connection uh, today? Uh, uh, what do we expect if we set up a connection today? Uh, of course, we expect it use all the modern standards. Uh, IPv6, TLS, et cetera, et cetera. And we also expect uh, today that it's been a secure channel and also private. So privacy is guaranteed. Um, so think of um, uh, this is uh, how we see how such a connect by name interface should look like API. Um, I want uh, the first, the, the service name, DNS quad nine. I want a DOH service, so DNS over HTTP, and give me a connection with is C. And underneath this simple call, we should see all the happy eyeballs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We expect, eh? so the modern standard secure and private. So to visualize this bit, so this is the happy eyeball. Happy eyeball is that we prefer IPv6 over IPv4 if it's there. So if I do a DNS lookup, um, uh, we su simultaneously submit uh, a query to DNS uh, quad nine. And uh, is IPv6 already arrived, we set up the TLS? No. So we give IPv6 a little head start uh, uh, or extra time, 25 milliseconds. If it's not arrived after IPv4 has been uh, received, uh if it has arrived within 25 seconds we still we also go to the ipv6 setup tls if it's not we go over ipv4 but still there can be late arrivals and we want to administrate that so we put the late arrival still in the list and if uh if, if from, from all the addresses we receive um if one of them fails we fail over to another one so it, it tries also to balance between IPv6 availability and responsiveness, of course. <clears throat> so, you, oh, sorry. So you see that, that there are many things going on, and you have to uh, cater or organize for all kinds of different scenarios. Um, so, DNSSEC needs DNSSEC validation for Quad9. Um, so that also has to take place. Uh, and we also have something like Dane. Yeah, so that is the DNS uh, authenticated named entities. So given uh, all the certificates authorities we see in the PKI, with Dane and Nelnet Labs, for account. So, well, out of this 
five or ten different certificate authorities, they say, well, we have a certificate for another labs. No, we say only this person, only this certificate authority is being used by another labs or for our domain. So we can kind of point to specific certificates and uh, ignore all other certificates, which gives more trust and uh, security in the system. So with happy eyeballs, Dinasec and Dane, even more things going on. So besides the lookup, which is going sim simultaneously, you also have to do the Dinasec validation. And if you want to set up a uh, TLSA uh, connection, uh, you also need uh, the Dane authentication. So here you see a flow chart again. So uh, different scenarios, fallback scenarios. If this not works, something else has to work. So it's complex. And then added to this, you can also exchange uh, some of the Dane uh, lookup um, at the first TLS handshake. We call it the TLS chain extension. It's currently a draft in the ITF. Uh, well, I don't won't go into the details, but you see that the number of scenarios and the fallback, etc., and you have to organize that, it becomes more and more complex. Given what I expect from setting up a, a, a connection, safe and private. Good. Um, then we have the zero conf DNSSEC, which additional complexity. Uh, most of the named services running on your system, they come kind of pre-configured with a root certificate of the, for the DNS, uh, but they are installed by the system admin. But there are also typically applications running as a user uh, in user space uh, that also needs DNSSEC. So they, they don't have this privilege to securely put a root certificate on a special place. So they have to grab all the trust anchors from the IANA website, they are pre-configured with uh, the ICANN certificate, or to, uh, with the ICANN long well, certificate, which uh, is, I think, is a CMS certificate, uh, still valid to 2030 something. Uh, but then it can safely uh, go to the website, get all the DNS uh, trust anchors, and uh, bootstrap from that. So, well, you see, here's another uh, scenario or the, the same scenario, but extended and extended. Um, sorry, I for time, I'll speed up a bit. Um, also, I won't go here into detail, but then eh, all looks up, lookups has to be privately and similar things has to be done for DNS. We just did the DNS 53, they call it nowadays, the classic DNS. And for DOT, DNS over TLS, or D, DNS over HTTP, uh, it, it also involves another, uh, the same happy eyeballs, but with some other extra requirements. Um, and much, much more. And we have a number of uh, ROCs, DNS roadblock avoidance, I won't go, uh, the DNS uh, 6.4, so we're uh, with, uh, with uh, net, net uh, from, from a six, uh, IPv6 network over to an IPv4 network, it becomes very, very complex. So what does it mean for us to set up a connection? You have to kind of orchestrate all these activities such that it gives you, uh, well, it's it sounds good to the ear, of course. Uh, you have to orchestrate all these different scenarios such that it converts to the things you expect at the highest possible security and privacy level. Um, but it's also very complex to, to implement. So what's connect by name? You want to turn this orchestration of all these individual uh, components into a simple interface where you just say, hello, I want to connect with you, and that's it. So that's the goal, to, have, to reduce all this complexity or hide this, all this complexity into a simple connect by name. I, I, I want to connect with you over this uh, interface for this service. Um, yeah, I want to conclude with that. Stop sharing. Um, yes, yeah, I thank, thank you. you. Oh, sorry. Well, yeah, well, thank you, uh, Benno. That's uh, very interesting, both on the uh, 
uh, and the aspect of uh, of securing some of the key function of the DNS and the the, ser the key ceremony is always uh, a tremendous uh, uh, visibility worldwide, and and there are always people asking question if uh, scenarios and uh, it's good to hear that uh, uh, we have uh, efforts in that direction and the other one uh, to uh, looking for uh, simplification and, and using actually the the dns for for uh, well uh, simply using this project for simplifying some of aspect of uh, interacting with uh, with name technology i think that's that's very yeah. good thank you uh, i think we have uh, a little bit of time for a couple of questions before uh, alexander uh, takes the floor um from the audience you can either uh, use the chat or you can uh, uh, take the floor uh, using the mic uh, if there are uh, any question or some comments uh, with a related effort uh, I think, well, uh, as as mentioned, the, the presentation will be um, rec is recorded, so yeah. you will have access to the to the presentation afterwards, and and this will be publicized. I suppose you you will exchange also your slides, uh, Beno, so that yeah. people can yeah. access to this material. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, well, if there are no uh, precise question of these two projects. Uh, which um, uh, because we will we'll have a panel session which will uh, address a wider uh, topics so uh, policy topics standardization with the with the, yeah. everyone in a panel mode so if there are no specific question on these uh, uh, two projects uh, I propose we move on to um, Alexander so Alexander is uh, okay. is um, oh, thank can you I yes make one yes. small remark so what we did for our uh, DINASEC key ceremony, we did validate our documents also with PCH, so it's, uh, with Packet Clearinghouse, which implements uh, uh, also the key ceremonies. And to be uh, from them, and I also understand they have looked with one eye to the ICANN uh, uh, key ceremony. So. There's, there might be some small differences, but the PCH clear, uh, the packet clearinghouse key ceremony has many similarities with uh, the ICANN's uh, key ceremony. So maybe we can discuss that later. I see that uh, Dave, Conrad, and um, um, Roy are also in the call, so maybe they can comment later on that. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. That will be was... interesting to compare the, the, the two approaches mm -hmm. and find some synergy tools. Yeah. Uh, right. <clears throat> Uh, now let's uh, let's move to uh, another projects uh, and uh, that uh, is uh, is looking at a specific software that is is well known in uh, the DNS server world uh, it's uh, uh, this is um, uh, power dns uh, and uh, alexander the tar Terra, Terra, sorry, uh, for my uh, pronunciation, from the Open Exchange uh, Company, and, and more precisely uh, the, the subsidiary looking at uh, the Power uh, DNS uh, products. Uh, right. Hello, Alexander, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. I hope you can hear me as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Let me uh, 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 start the presentation. So. Our project is about uh, implementing a number of privacy enhancements for the open source uh, Power DNS and, and DNS diff. So I will. I have a number of slides um, uh, to present that. Um, I think maybe a lot of the things are already known, uh, but I will go through them and introduce uh, 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 Power DNS um, a bit. So what what we have is Power DNS provides. Um, as you can see on this slide, a number of open source uh, DNS solutions. We have the Power DNS Recursor, which is a resolver uh, solution used for serving uh, uh, clients with their um, with the correct uh, answers to their DNS queries. We have Power DNS Authoritative Server, which is used by domain name hosters um, to to store or to to serve yeah to, to to store the domain names and to host the domain names. And the third component that uh, consists so that is uh, that exists within the open source uh, solutions of Power DNS is DNS Dist, which is a uh, DNS distributor, DNS uh, a specific DNS uh, focused load balancer, uh, and it comes with all kinds of uh, capabilities to, to add protection and, and prevent against uh, misuse of the DNS infrastructure. 
Um, but specifically here, it is interesting because it also provides the capabilities uh, to function as a uh, DOH and DOT uh, encryption endpoint. Um, so that means that when you deploy DNS disk in front of your resolver, you can turn any uh, DNS infrastructure into a uh, DOH, DNS over HTTPS uh, encrypted uh, service. And this works both with Power DNS recursor, but it also works with uh, all other um, DNS, uh, DNS servers. So encryption of the DNS traffic. DNS is one of the last remaining non-encrypted protocols, as, as well everyone here is aware. Um, but the current trend, of course, is to move this way and get DNS uh, encrypted to get a more secure connection from the client to the resolver. That's where most of the um, the attention now is, and the actual support for that is is increasing massively because uh, browsers are. Uh, supporting more and more encrypted DNS, uh, uh, mobile phones are starting to implement um, and also promote uh, encrypted DNS, uh, all based on the IETF standards uh, for doing so, either DNS over TLS or DNS over uh, HTTPS. Um, so this is all good um, for privacy uh, in itself, of course. There is a, um, a, a drawback to this, however, uh, and that is while the, the adoption of encrypted DNS and the interest in DNS in encrypted DNS increasing, uh, so far there is only a limited uptake of actual DNS encrypted services that are, for example, run by, by network operators or ISPs. Um, so while at the same, at, at the one hand, uh, use of encrypted DNS is being promoted and, and is increasing, um, with only a limited number of people providing DNS over HTTPS uh, services. This means that actually the, the DNS traffic um, is being centralized or, or has the risk of being massively centralized. Um, so while you can say that since encryption is increasing, privacy is increasing, it also means that there is more information being centralized to only a handful of, uh, of parties. Um, so this brings the conclusion that there is uh, definitely the need um, for additional privacy-friendly uh, DOH deployments uh, on the one hand so that people have the choice to where they move their uh, DNS traffic, but also it is important to have a, um, to, to actually use a, a, D, a DOH service um, that, for example, is in the same uh, jurisdiction as you are, or at least has a, um, enough protection in terms of privacy by itself, for example, by the nature of the country where it is in. Um, so this is a bit of a background uh, of why it's important that there are uh, more solutions and more DOH servers available, uh, either by um, by network operators or by, by others. So the goal in general, uh, what PowerDNS is aiming for is, of course, to enhance the availability of this kind of software, so open source DNS software, together with other, other open source implementations, which in turn allow operators to provide this. Uh, and this specific project aims to add a number of additional privacy features that are uh, currently not there in PowerDNS um, that we will add to that. Let me very briefly go through what we uh, are doing or plan on doing. So the encryption between the clients on the left and the actual DNS uh, recursor that is there, it's, it's implemented in, in DNS this for a long time, but also in other open source uh, recursors, they support, uh, uh, there are a number of, of recursors that already support uh, DOH. So the left part is actually encrypted. Um, but one thing that, that we are going to, uh, are busy with actually encrypting is the traffic from the recursors to the authoritative service. So that's part of the ongoing uh, uh, project. Uh, one is the actual encryption between recursors and authoritative servers. Uh, but one important aspect of that is also the discovery mechanism. So how does a recursor or resolver know that the authoritative server that is trying to reach um, actually supports um, uh, uh, encrypted connections? But there is an initial IETF uh, proposal for this discovery mechanism. Uh, my colleague Peter van Dijk uh, has been involved in that. And I know that the, the previous speaker, Benno, has also been uh, involved in many discussions around these, uh, these standards here. Um, 
and we aim to to further this discussion uh, let's say in the coming months and and to implement the draft uh, as soon as there is a reasonable uh, idea that that any draft that there's there will also uh, make a chance of being the actual mechanism for uh, um, for doing these kind of discovery um, another part is that we are currently improving uh, by adding a number of features to DNS disk that make it easier to deploy DNS disk in an environment where there is also uh, HTTP caches uh, present, because right now, and if you have an H, so all, all HTTP, uh, DNS over HTTPS traffic is uh, indistinguishable from other uh, traffic uh, over HTTPS, but for caches, it's important to be aware that actually um, a different timings count for caches, for example, if it is concerning uh, a DNS query. Another thing we are implementing are DOH uh, performance testing tools uh, to test the performance of, of DNS disk, but also other DOH performances. Um, and it's important to have these kind of tools to simulate actual DOH traffic and, and see if any enhancements that we make uh, uh, make sense and, and how they, uh, uh, they work out. And then, uh, other improvements that we are currently working on is QNAME minimization. Um, and that is a, a, a way of breaking up the resolution, you can say. Uh, and not so, so in general, when you do a, a, a resolution of a domain name, you can ask the authoritative server and it will point you to other authoritative servers that, that can provide you with the answer. Um, however, in practice, you usually ask the entire question and just leaking a lot of information to all the authoritative servers in between. And QNAME minimization uh, prevents uh, that by doing the resolution step by step. I'm sorry. Um, so we implemented QNAME minimization earlier this year, but right now we are improving on this uh, improved heuristics because it turns out that if you do this step by step resolution, you run into uh, specific challenges of, of uh, misconfigured domains, uh, all kinds of of loops, C name loops, um, and you want the resolver to take care of it. So at some point to detect that it's actually running into a loop and still provide the, uh, the client with the right answer. Uh, and another item we are implementing is EDNS zero padding, and it's again a privacy enhancing feature because it prevents um, leakage of information by, by standardizing the length of, of uh, the information in the, in the query package so that you can by inspecting the package, get any idea of what is the actual uh, actual being sent over this. Um, so this is a very quick overview of the kind of things that we are implementing at this moment uh, uh, for the both the, uh, the the Power DNS software itself. But of course, it's very important that we do this in the context of the standardization because it can only work if it is uh, standardized in such a way that resolvers and authoritative service of all uh, uh, well, different sorts uh, can interact over the internet uh, in a seamless way. So, um, in summary, um, as I mentioned, so and as we know, the encryption of DNS is gaining a lot of traction, which is in itself good for privacy. But the way uh, it is being offered by only a limited number of parties uh, right now um, uh, makes sure that it's actually being concentrated, and it might. Um, at some point have an, uh, uh, a negative effect on privacy, in fact. So in order to actually increase privacy, we need more uh, privacy-focused implementations and deployments of those implementations. Um, and what we are doing is uh, well, further implementing the features in PowerDNS and dns dist to, uh, to allow this to happen. So that was it. Thank you. I think I went through the slides pretty quickly. Uh, thank you very much, Alexander. I think this uh, is is very uh, useful to understand some of the development towards uh, security and privacy, which honestly are were not initially a top priority of the the concept of of DNS. And uh, as you early mentioned, this is uh, an area of uh, of uh, improvement where many people are contributing. And I think this uh, this panel is is, is almost uh, all about uh, about this. Uh, so, uh, any question on um, uh, on these developments from the audience? I see I, I see a, a, a question or a comment from Rick. Uh, Rick, would you like to take the floor? 
Um, basically, it's just an open question. I know there are at least, but I know of two technologies for encrypting DNS. And one of them is DNS curve. The other is indeed uh, DNS over HTTPS. Um, the latter has a lot of adds a lot of layers. So I'm really curious how DNS curve is, is if it's being considered by Power DNS and if it's actually being deployed by people around the the world. Um, to me, it sounds like a lightweight solution, but I don't know the last bit of it. So it's just an open question. Um, I, so I, at this stage, we are not uh, actively considering that, but it's also practically that we see that, that currently it is DNS over HTTPS, which is gaining a lot of traction, partially because the traffic um, is, is covered up as HTTPS traffic. Um, yeah, so, of course, the disadvantage of HTTPS is you need, always need a host name, therefore you need a set provider, therefore you are tied to a particular party and that might lead to lock-in problems. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I'm a bit concerned about these movements. Um, without knowing all the bits about it, I have to add. I know a lot about DNS, about encryption, but not that, about this specific solution. But it's something that I'm afraid of. So um, what I'm basically saying is, might it be an idea to consider a broader spectrum of possibilities? I know, I know there's a strong uh, tendency towards doing what the others do, but that's not how innovation works. Uh, that's perhaps the path towards centralizing everything, and that might be a risk. So that's just something that's just question here. Yeah. I'll cover that part later. OK, thank you. So so in, in defense of uh, the choices, uh, uh, I'm just about the tapping, I'm questioning. No, OK, yeah, yeah. No, in defense, your question. So maybe I, I should, yeah, I shouldn't be less defensive here. <laughs> now, um, the thing, and uh, Vittorio is also here, I see. The thing is that uh, the, the people from PowerDNS and Nelnet Labs ISC, um, so one step back, there has been a lot of comments on and critique maybe on DOH. So what the open source developers has, have been done is implementing DOH in their software products. So there is a choice. So there's less centralization by default if there's only one or two providers. Everyone can run our open source software. Every ISP can run DOH, et cetera, et cetera. So it, that was a strategic decision of the open source developers to implement DOH in their products, not because they love it, not because they go with the mainstream, but yeah. we think we should. Uh, and I think Vittorio can uh, tell this much better than I do, but it was also um, because we care about the community. And that's why we did it. Yeah, that's my, my concern too. Thanks for answering. I don't know if I can just take the floor. Sorry, this is my, I don't know if there's a raise uh, hand button here. But yeah, no, I, I, of course, the, there's also to, to be considered that, uh, first of all, we want to implement the ITF standards. So at the ITF, basically, DOH and DOT are the two uh, official standards. And in terms of, uh, I mean, the resolver to authoritative connection, there's a discussion going on on which should be the, the better standards. On the other hand, I mean, this, our software is open source. So if there are people interested in actually adding support for that, uh, they can just uh, start a discussion and maybe even contribute code. So that, that's, uh, that's uh, still open. And I mean, in terms of, I also wanted to address uh, Gemma's question on consolidation. Yeah, I think that, I mean, at least in terms of being a DNS vendor, what, what we can do is to try to make it as easy as possible for everyone to deploy to deploy the encrypted DNS servers. So that then, of course, it's for other parts of the industry, like the ISPs, uh, to take this up and deploy more DOH servers uh, and also DOT servers, so that, uh, I mean, that there are, for, in the end, consumers can have no choice. I mean, definitely, there is one technical issue, which is still the, the lack of uh, um, a way for automated discovery of uh, encrypted DNS servers, uh, especially those provided by the network operators, the ISPs. And so until we get the browsers to, I mean, we, we get a standard approved and browsers they implement it, it will be hard to also make it uh, easy for ISPs to deploy encrypted in essence, so to break this consolidation circle. Okay, very good. Well, I was about to uh, point out at the GMAS question that you already uh, answered, so thanks for, for that. And I believe this can be also a subject for the panel uh, because it goes uh, well beyond uh, what we heard right now. And well, feel free to continue interacting on uh, 
on the chat and with that let's uh, let's move to uh, the next uh, uh, presenter Leif uh, Johansson so Leif works for um, the Swedish um, research and education network SUNET uh, but is a, a very active uh, community in the communities uh, both on the academic networks in Europe uh, and in the IETF uh, as by chairing uh, and uh, having chaired uh, some uh, of the working group there uh, so welcome uh, Leif you have this is only a few of your uh, caps but one of them is also to be part of the cryptic uh, effort so uh, Leif, would you mind in, in you. Uh, yeah uh, tell us about yes, the cryptic in general and what yeah, you do I will right and I was uh, I, I'm I'm having a bit of a challenge when it comes to screen sharing can can I email you uh, a, a yes um no problem let's see here uh all right give me a second if you screen share you can just use the plus to upload your presentation to show it to us yeah the problem is that i'm using my ipad um to to be on the conference and i have um, i'm using a laptop for for everything else just try to keep the insanity of conference apps separate from from actual work um a little bit here so uh i will Send start talking over. i will yes i will start talking and 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 you have it in in the in your email in a second so the cryptic project is a an effort that's been going on for quite some time actually uh uh we sort of had the idea after the snowden revelations some some people in sort of the itf community to see if we could do something about open hardware hsms um Hardware is a different kind of project than, than a typical open source uh, projects, and it's not, uh, it, you know, it, it requires quite substantial amounts of funding. And over the years, Cryptic has been able to raise uh, quite a lot of money, and now latest in the Crypt Red project from from uh, from NDI, which has allowed us to continue, like actually, quite further, quite for much longer time than we we expected initially. Now, um, the uh, the cryptic project has produced hardware and has had hardware for quite some time. And we call the current platform the alpha, um, the alpha card and the alpha platform. The the uh, the purpose of that was to develop initial software, demonstrate the feasibility, and then to sort of progress to a next generation uh, uh, next generation uh, hardware. Now I'm uh, yes, indeed. So you can uh, skip ahead um, in the PDF a little bit. There we are, uh, and you can stay on the picture that that slide with the the um, right. So our initial set of sort of motivation building this was to sort of make a, a hardware platform available for the for for you know the community of projects that need high assurance signing and key management. This is sort of not a crypto accelerator. It wasn't meant to be. Or a, a crypto with crypt encryption functions. Um, it's developed along the lines of commercial uh, platforms, so all of the critical operations are implemented in FPGAs. And the the reason for that is because FPGAs are are uh, constant time by their very nature, um, which means that all of the signature you sort of re you re reduce the number of side channel attacks that are possible against a, a device like this. Um, the picture here is of an alpha um, hardware. It's sort of a extrude, custom-made extruded box, and uh, and a, and and a, uh, a I think a six-layer uh, card that has essentially an, a big FPA and some circuitry around it. Um, if we skip to the next slide, um, the um, the CryptReb project, which is sort of what the NGI Trust funds right now. Um, has had a few major uh, goals and it's sort of about to, if not wind down, that sort of close up formally as a project. And one of the most important things we've achieved here is that we are on the on the on the verge of of doing another red, right? Or if if the red box was our alpha, this is now our beta uh, hardware uh, engine, which is going to be a, a fairly big revision. It has. We converted all of our design document to KiCad, which means that you're not 
reliant on any proprietary tools in order to um, work on this, right? You can open it using open source tools and design, and continue designing the PCB. Um, the master key store used to be outside of the FPGA, which had some performance impacts, which is not, it's not inside the FPGA, uh, which sort of means that uh, serialization is sort of nanosecond um, time, you know, it means that you can essentially, I mean, one of the, one of the attack vectors against a, a really secure HSM is that you essentially fire, attack it by firing a bullet through it. You fire uh, a needle, a conductive needle at the right place in the HSM and you use the, it that to read uh, master key as it goes through. And you need to be able to respond to that kind of, that kind of speed uh, to a serialization event uh, in order to protect the master key. And we are sort of, we're at, at that level, we can achieve that. Um, and, you know, everything sort of got moved into the FPGA and distribution. And of course, one side and another side effect here, another part of the project is that we re redid the, the RSA cores, which are now sort of much, much faster. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'm not sure, I don't remember whether we have um uh i i think we are looking at number i don't well i'll just tell you we're looking at numbers um on the order of 100 100 and to 120 rsa signature 4k signatures per second uh and the the alpha version here had um we were able to achieve um only uh, below dozens of signatures per second in our first version, but now we're we're actually in the um, in the range of even above some commercial uh, products. Uh, so we're, we're we've made really really good progress here. Um, so we are looking at a board run, um, and right now we're shopping around for manufacturing companies who are actually going to do that for us. Uh, this has, of course, we as everybody else, we've taken a little bit of a hit. But um, like unlike open source project, you can't just sit home and do stuff like this. You actually have to run factories. Uh, and that means that um, you know, we are especially hit with COVID uh, effects. Uh, we, we do hope that in Q1, we're gonna have a new version, Q1, Q2, we're gonna have a new version of, 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 um, of, the, um, of the HSM available. Last time, what we did is we made this available through ca uh, crowd supply. So crowdsupply.com, I, I don't actually know whether we're going to do that this time, but I think we might. It's a really great way of sort of shipping out and making sort of open hardware available to the general public. Uh, let's see, let's do next slide. Yeah, this is sort of more status. Um, one of the major changes here was to redo the entire master key memory. So. A common part of uh, any uh, uh, HSM approach is that you have a master key that encrypts all other keys and zeroizing the HSM, protecting the, the HSM is all about protecting the master key. So typically you keep a special kind of memory. And what's changed here in this version is that we actually implemented that memory inside the FPGA. Um, so even those operations, the wrap-on-wrap wrap operations are also sort of uh, constant time and sort of less susceptible to side channel attack. Um, so I'm, the rest of the slides, I think, are mostly status slides. Um, well, these are details. I don't know how, how much detail you guys want, but basically uh, we've done a lot of work on the when I say cores, I'm, I'm assuming some knowledge here, but we're actually talking about um, Verilog implementations of key functions of the FPGA. So for instance, this thing called modexp ng. Modexp is the key operation, the core operation in an RSA uh, crypto suite, for instance. And all of that is implemented in inside an FPGA. Um, yeah. So this is um, numbers uh, that I quoted earlier. Uh, we are looking at some fairly competitive uh, um, 
performance for, for the next version of the hardware, which is sort of, wasn't actually our goal to be um, compete on speed, but you know, it's, it's nice to be able to have gotten there. And, you know, well, I think everybody can, in the, on this call, I think we're mostly talking about DNS applications. And, and I guess what I, what I um, would like very much is for us to uh, have contact with projects who are doing innovative stuff with DNS that need access to high assurance uh, signatures. Um, one of the things we have worked on, for instance, we haven't finished, but we have worked, started working on our um, uh, quantum safe um, hash-based signature schemes in the, in the HSM. So I think I'll stop there. Um, and uh, if anybody has questions, uh, please ask them. Um, Thank you, I will, Leif. I will, I will briefly step away from this call, but I will be on the chat. Uh, and then if somebody has anything, I'll be back in a jiffy. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Leif, uh, for this uh, progress report of, uh, of this effort. that is, as you mentioned, uh, uh, already uh, started some time ago. and. Uh, and witnessing that it's uh, it's getting uh, performance improvement is uh, is very reassuring. Um, any question for Leif before he's uh, he's moving to the chat? Uh, well, apparently... so the question of who is serious is a hard one. Um... I would say that um, a lot of open source HSM projects fail to take a side channel attacks into account. Uh, I think it's um, and yes, I know Roland. I will, you know, this definitely a person we 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 talk to when it comes to quantum tech. But you know, it, it, most of the like dongle based so called HSMs suffer from a, a, a lack of side channel protection. You simply can't shield stuff that well. Um, and it's um, the, the right now, the, the, the price of the, the one, the last version we sold was under $1,000, which is definitely a lot less than, uh, than, um, um, than a, a commercial HSM. Okay. Well, maybe a bit of a naive question. When uh, we have an open hardware project here, so uh, presumably you go to the design and, and you go probably further down uh, in terms of uh, electrical uh, okay. uh, okay. yes, layout. Um, sorry, Leif, uh, can you hear me? Well, I'm not sure Leif is with us anymore. Um, Leif, well, I think he has uh, he has to to step away. So uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, have uh, opportunities to interact with him uh, afterwards, uh, and um, and have, uh, have a chat uh, discussion with him. So uh, let's move. Um, next uh, is uh, Rick Rick Van Rain from uh, Internet Wide. Thanks, Rick, for joining. He will bring a, a little bit of a different perspective. Uh, on how to use uh, DNS technology. We saw that there are many developments for hardening this technology and, and probably it's uh, an opportunity to use it for booting trust in, in other applications. So uh, Rick, without further, I leave you the floor. Thank you. Um, you should be watching my screen now, if I'm correct. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm, since it's so short, I made a, just a textual document in Markdown. Uh, format very no, no, known to open source developers and actually it's a big tip towards the European Union as well but I'll get to that. Um, if you look at what happened on the pro internet over the years in 1985 we had BBSs with phone in connections and there were pro proprietary services for chat email file exchange pretty much what we do these days actually. Um, online control um, then entered with 1995 basically um, you could host a web domain you could host a domain with a web server and email and all that and all of a sudden we could be someone or someone.nl or someone.eu at uh, at the internet and host our own corner of the internet and that's pretty much a central idea of the internet that control is distributed now 
fast forward to, I think, 2010 onwards somewhere. Um, what we're doing now is we're making using our phones to make connections to proprietary services again for chat, email, and file exchange. The simplest of the things you could do are being proprietarized and are being made incompatible with other things. You see, they're gradually seeping in. And it's called a free service, but I always put quotes around that because it's always an assault to privacy and uh, security is very often questionable because of the massive scale at which these, these operations take place. So I think we are sort of moving back in progress, not in terms of color and bandwidth, not in terms of the media types we can exchange, but the so-called simple and so-called free solutions uh, made us lose a few core values. That's distribution and control over our online presence. So next, the central to the software internet, as far as we're concerned in our project, is that the name ownership via domain names must be distributed. I want to have my own domain name and I don't want anyone controlling anything I do online behind the at sign. I want to be Rick at my own domain and I don't want to be Rick at Facebook or Rick at Google. And that's a vital point because all the traffic behind the ad, the, all the traffic passes through servers that are mentioned behind the ad. So basically you give control away where, as soon as you give the part behind the ad away. So to avoid this sort of thing and to avoid central services that would implement some other naming service, uh, DNS being the decentral one, um, I think the, the, the requirements are um, distributed name ownership, so DNS is important, that's why I mentioned it a few times. Um, open protocols are there to allow you to have uh, domains that can connect with, with one another. And the more proprietary they get, the more closed things get, and the more difficult it becomes to co collaborate over the internet between those domain owners. Basically, it's vendor locking in a new, in a new form. Um, and HTTP sounds like an open protocol, but actually it's so generic that people build proprietary things over HTTP. And the typical example is download our app, or you have to run our JavaScript code in order to view this, this, this data. But those are typical of proprietary services running over an open protocol. So you should have the entire protocol stack open. Um, open source, I think, is a major driver of, of uh, sovereignty for, for uh, end users. Namely, it, uh, it allows you to have maximum benefit of open protocols, make extensions, look at what, what others have done to, to take, on, take up on that. And open documents is another part because you can have no protocol to exchange closed documents and you're still stuck with vendor lock-in. There's many kinds of vendor lock-in in the modern internet and somehow we are gradually giving away control over our online presence through that path. Um, and um, 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 just to give an example specific to the European Union, because Jean-Luc, I remember that you mentioned the opening call for NGI uh, pointer that you wanted to slim down um, the processing in the EU. If you exchange docx uh, files that you now exchange over email with markdown, the format I'm using here, basically uh, on the left I'm editing, on the right you see how it's going to watch. Of course you want to have a GUI tool, you want to have version control with Git rather than set passing around binary copies. And um, you would have versioning, man, uh, amendment automation, you would have an open ability to open this discussion or keep it closed, you would have dis distribution of lawmaking, um, your documents will be proved to, for centuries to come um, without any special software requirements. And you will have a proper input for digital signers, signatures and encryption so that you can actually make strong legal statements with, with the content. And um, there's no risk for adding white text, for example, and signing that accidentally. Uh, and all this is very light. It's how we, how we develop open source and what keeps us very volatile, very active, very very involved with the core tasks that we are at. And your core tasks are different from a developer, but I think this is very much, very worthy experiment to try for the European Union. Um, anyway, it will, it will mean getting back to software and internet. And that's pretty much what I'm about here. So back to the project, internet-wide. What we try to design is a hosting infrastructure because hosting providers are the stepping stone for end users to their own domain management. And that's pretty much lagging behind because for 20 years or so, they've been stuck at only websites and only email. And there's none of them adding telephony or chat is very rare. And these standards exist. They're just not implemented. They're just difficult to maintain. 
And we're trying to make a hosting infrastructure that allows this to be done. And basically what we say is you have two layers of hosting hosting provider. One of them manages identities, such as email addresses, such as host names. And the other layer basically provides services that can be plugged in. So you can have WordPress run a service for you, but run it underneath your own domain. And that's pretty much the general reasoning here. Um, owned identities, meaning if it's John at example.com, you want to be the owner of example.com and otherwise you want to use another uh, identity. And um, most protocols can actually handle this uh, because most protocols handle this through SASL or Kerberos. That's how they authenticate. That's built in already. You don't need to extend on that to be using this. So that's a very, very powerful idea to use in just about any protocol you can think of. The one exception is HTTP, who seems to be inventing the, the wheels again and again. We're extending that with a SASL extension. That's a generic plugin point for that sort of thing, so that it can also grow up and finally um, be open to people so that you don't need an account for every single web server you visit, but you can basically present your own account and say, well, they know how to reach you. That brings on the, the middle point, the third point, Realm Crossover. When I want to be John at example.com and I want to run up to maybe gmail.com and I want to be able to present my identity being John at example.com, there must be some way for Gmail to find back my own domain and ask it, is it really John or is it Rick or whatever? He, he wants to be able to verify the identity. That mechanism, uh, that idea, we've called Realm Crossover. And we have mechanisms for that uh, to do this with SASL and Kerberos authentication. So the protocols that I use to talk to the server can be SASL or Kerberos uh, um, empowered. And the domains would have a way to link back to the domain, so the part behind the ad, to see is this really this person. So this person can gain their own, keep their own uh, sovereignty over their address, but at the same time allow others to enjoy the benefits of knowing this person. Um, open protocols are, well, I pretty much covered that. Most of them just do SASL or Kerberos and or Kerberos, I should say, because SASL automatically implies Kerberos. Um, and these are different in the way they work. SASL is like a per session logon, whereas Kerberos is something you log on to once a day and then for the rest of the day you you can then enjoy the benefits. It's a single sign-on, but not like most single sign-on systems. It's not a web-specific single sign-on, but it's cross all across the board. Every protocol can basically do this um, directly or through SASL. Um, to allow Realm Crossover to work, there needs to be a connection between domains that doesn't exist yet. And uh, that means we need to make small extensions there. So the client to server communication is a standard protocol, but the linkage between the domains to allow them to collaborate on identities and allow the client to use something at their own domain as their identity. This linkage between domains requires a few extensions. And we made two things. SASL over diameter is a rather trivial thing to specify, and it takes some work to, to work out. But Basically, it allows you to make a backhaul to the client's domain and ask, is this really this person? We are forwarding the SESL authentication. And for Kerberos, we found a mechanism that allows two KDCs, the Kerberos key uh, control centers, to basically know each other so that example.com and gmail.com will know about each other and could use that for months for all the users of either uh, of either domain. So that's an incredibly efficient mechanism to very, very quickly get in. But this is um, pretty much the design um, that, we are, that we're heading towards in the hope to decentralize the internet back to how it was in the 1995 years, in the middle period, the blossoming period of the internet, mm -hmm. when everything grew before it grew out of proportion. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the proposed uh, use case involving the EU. Uh, there are certainly some uh, progress to be made there, uh, but uh, one one effort we did for this uh, webinar is to use uh, a non-proprietary uh, and open source uh, video system. So you see, we are trying our best. And the other thing is you mentioned uh, open source. I think it's important to stress that all uh, projects that we are talking today, they are open source and open uh, protocols. Um, so any questions for Rick? Uh, 
on this uh, proposition, on this proposal? Well, uh, there is a question, is this project similar to OpenID and or Fediverse? Um, Rick? OpenID uh, is um, a web-specific protocol. So it locks you into your browser. And that basically limits you to, for example, you can't do your email with OpenID. If I'm correct, I might be corrected here. Uh, yeah, okay. I don't know if it's in the context of OpenID Connect or if it's uh, the Federated uh, Identity Exchange, but... Uh... Uh, and uh, is, is it the question, Beno, or is it uh, answering to another? Uh, it's not a question to me. No, 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 no. But there, you, you just made a comment, which I believe is, is to another discussion. So I think that's uh, that's it. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, that's it for, for this uh, presentation. Thank you, Rick. Let's move to another uh, interesting development. Uh, around the, the GNU uh, the GNU world, uh, GNU net, and uh, the GNU name system proposed by uh, uh, by a number of the, this this community. Christian, uh, the floor is yours for maybe giving a few words about the GNU net, and then you yes, know. I will start with that. Uh, of Thank course. You. So so the GNU name system uh, came out of the GNU net project, where we're trying to build a more decentralized internet. And uh, lots of the themes have been here already on this, why we need this. <clears throat> One way to look at it is that the original internet design goals were very much for the military needs. And so also the DNS has this military hierarchy, and we all should bow to the root zone and ICANN for that. Um, and in GNU we want things to be decentralized and free software and free everything retained under the user's control with free software. Uh, we would not use open source because, of course, uh, that's... Uh, uh, actually a, a term for emphasizing technological advantages over human rights. So we would say it's about free software. Um, but uh, so today we're going to focus a bit on the GNU name system. Uh, in GNU-NET overall, we have a bunch of applications like anonymous file sharing, IPv4, v6 protocol uh, translation, conversation for voice over GNU-NET, the GNU name system itself. Uh, for identity management, which was just a topic before, we have Reclaim ID. Uh, which uh, can be used for general identity management, but it's also OpenID Connect compatible, for example. So you can build on top of the GNU name system a general identity management, which would allow you to do the things that uh, uh, we just talked about. Uh, we also have uh, GNU Tala, which is our uh, electronic payment system, um, and Anastasis, which is for key recovery. Uh, we talked before, we saw this uh, hardware security module and the key signing and ceremony uh, presentations. Uh, in my view, both of these are not really likely to be feasible for end users. And if I want to be in control of my servers, means I have to be in control of my keys. So are you going to tell you know, 500 million European Union citizens to buy a hardware security module and follow a key signing ceremony? I hope not. Uh, these kind of technologies, for me, are always, again, something that work very well if you have this very centralized, institutionalized providers that kind of go against my uh, goal of decentralizing things. So our architecture, uh, briefly, software-wise, we have the GNU name system here on top. Uh, below it, there is a subsystem for revocation, so key revocation, uh, which is building on top of uh, uh, Epstein-style set reconciliation protocol um, and a distributed hash table. Uh, those are running on top of the GNU net core, which I've abstracted here. There's a lot more detail to it. Um, GNS also uses a subsystem we call identity, where we basically keep your private keys. Um, and those we would then back up uh, uh, in a decentralized way to multiple providers that don't have to be trusted, that don't earn anything in a truly oblivious way. Um, and those could be paid, for example, by Anastasis for providing the service. Um, and Tala itself also uses Reclaim ID, for example, for uh, providing things like sh uh, shipping addresses. Uh, when uh, doing shopping, and there we tie back into the GNU name system, possibly. So that's uh, part of the GNU-NET architecture. Uh, the whole picture could not be done in 10 minutes here. Yeah, so in terms of system architecture, gnu Tala is actually a classical client-server application, uh, in part because we believe finance is OK to be more centralized because there's lots of regulatory requirements. Uh, we actually 
are uh, now talking with the European Central Bank and got comments that our architecture uh, was very interesting and brilliant from the people who are responsible for looking at the digital euro. So there is some hope there. Uh, Anastasis in return is not exactly client server because we use multiple servers in, cl in clouds that don't have to be trusted, don't have to run on secure hardware. Uh, Reclaim itself is self-sovereign identities, so it's completely decentralized. Everybody can control their identity, but we can have trusted authorities for attestation. So, for example, a university could say, yeah, these are my students, or a community could say, yeah, this person lives in our community. Um, so there can be authorities in there, whereas GNU itself, the, the course uh, system is fully decentralized and peer-to-peer -peer, uh, without trusted third parties. Uh, yes, uh, the DHT is uh, similar to Cardemlia or CAT, uh, just a, a couple of uh, changes to the DHT in, uh, from Cardemlia. But yes, we're using the Cardemlia X or style routing rig. So GNU name system itself, what are the key points? Well, DNS. We have still problems with source amplification for DDoS from DNS. We still have the problem of censorship. Uh, here I use China, but I could also use Germany or Switzerland. Switzerland is basically going and saying, oh, we want to block uh, illegal gambling, so let's change stuff in DNS for that. Germany has blocked political parties in DNS in front of elections. Uh, those problems do not go away uh, by having a, an encrypted connection to your resolver. These problems go away by decentralizing database, giving everybody control over their zone, and decentralizing the lookup and having a recursive resolve on every single system. Uh, DNS is also part of the mass surveillance apparatus. We see this with the more cowbell program from the NSA. We know it's abused for the offensive cyber war. Quantum DNS will not go away because you route your traffic to Cloudflare. They can just still quantum you right there because Cloudflare and Google are obviously under American jurisdiction. So these things will not be fixed by the Band-Aid solutions that we see with DNS over TLS, DOH, DNSSEC, DPRIVE, ODNS. The only thing we do is we drive up the cost of implementing this result in very complex protocols. Complexity is the enemy of both end users being able to handle it themselves and also the enemy of security. So these are not solutions that will address these fundamental challenges. With the GNU name system, we can have a fully decentralized name system where every user controls their own zone, every user can define their own root zone. Of course, we can have a social consensus on what it should look like. We can have globally unique and secure, identific secure identification of users. We have query and response privacy with respect to the participants that store the name resolution data. So if I have to talk to another machine that has zone data and I want to query that zone data, I can get to that zone data without telling them what my query is and without them necessarily learning what the response is. Uh, the result is we get a public key infrastructure. We can use this, you know, we have Dane implemented in the GNU name systems. We can have Dane records. I can use it to certify GNU PG keys. I can use it to, uh, to look up IP addresses. All of these things are possible. We've added to this uh, virtually instant key revocation by flooding the key revocation of the P2P network with some additional caveats on the uh, uh, getting to people that have been offline at the time. Uh, but it's extremely efficient, more efficient than the current revocation mechanisms out there. Uh, and it's interoperable with DNS. Uh, as part of the Dasein uh, project, we showed that basically users cannot tell the difference whether they're using GNS or DNS if, if they're given a pre-configured system. Uh, yeah. Applications for it, of course, we can replace DNS with it. We have implemented a tool called Ascension, which allows you to import an existing DNS zone into GNS. We did this against the .se zone, which is a public zone. You know, zone transfer is possible, so we could do it. Uh, of course, tiny, tiny zones are never a problem. Uh, we can use this beyond DNS for things like a PKI for decentralized social networking applications. So we want to get out of Facebook and LinkedIn and MySpace and whatever else is out there. You know, we need a, a decentralized PKI for this, where we where I can identify users. We can do this with GNS. We can use it for identity management, both with certified attributes. Uh, we use attribute-based encryption, so I can also say I'm granting you access to my certified attribute, but only to this portion. So you can only whatever have my shipping address, but not my uh, phone number. Right, so this is something that some is reclaim. And we can also, of course, use this as a PKI for email. Yeah, next steps. Um, well, NGI Discovery is why I'm here. So we have written an RFC star protocol specification for, NG for GNS and a second implementation in Go. And to give you an idea, GNS, which gives you basically more than the advantages of the existing crazy DNS stack, was implemented in 2009 of Go code. 
the second implementation. And the revocation logic was another 750 lines of code. So this is not a huge implementation effort uh, uh, for somebody to you know, do another implementation, port it to some system, or integrate it with some application, in contrast to you know, try doing DNS over quick. Uh, in NGI Trust, we have a, a project where we're doing attribution for reclaim and integrating this with WhoCommerce to basically provide uh, sh shipping information and then can ta pay uh, with privacy with Taller, uh, having kind of the Amazon-like shopping experience but without an account. Uh, and but similar usability in the end is the goal. Yeah, uh, NGI Zero also paid for security audit of GNU Taler and the Taler Auditor deployment. That's still work in progress. Uh, NGI Ledger was a very catastrophic program for us because we first got promised there would be money, and then they decided that screwed up their process, and we had already spent money. So screw Ledger. Uh, I don't want to do stuff with funding box anymore. Uh, ter terrible, terrible project management uh, from the European side there. Uh, from the coordinators. Uh, I love an LNet. Um, yeah, and with Pointer, we tried to propose building a privacy friendly decentralized internet, but they were not interested. Not sure why we didn't even get uh, into the second round with reasonable reviews. Yeah, future work. Uh, we have here Elias Sommermatter, who is actually working on doing an RFC style specification of the set protocol for the set reconciliation where we. Uh, that is used to uh, disseminate revocation certificates to parties that have been offline at the time of the revocation. This part here is already speci specified as part of uh, NGI0. Uh, we would like to, at some point, you know, work a bit more on the GNU Core and DHT because there's lots of performance and usability issues there. Uh, I have no idea what's going to happen with Anastasis next. Uh, the Tala project, you know, we're talking with the European Central Bank. If that works, we will not have to worry, worry about money, I guess, um, and uh, reclaim. Uh, we hope this is going to be something that will be used for identity management platforms, electronic patient dossiers, and other applications that need decentralized identity management with privacy. Yeah, that was it. I'm open for questions. Right. Thank you for uh, for this uh, presentation, uh, and also for the pointers that uh, everybody can uh, can check. Uh, just one side comment for Ledger. Uh, well, it's uh, it's not the right place to point a finger point at anybody. Uh, <laughs> there has been some issue, procedural issue, which uh, led to a conclusion. Uh, but uh, for your information, there will be a new call. Uh, and as far as I can see, uh, there has been some very successful effort in other area of NGI. So I, I, I think it's there are uh, room for uh, additional uh, proposal uh, for, for anybody. Uh, but uh, back to your uh, uh, proposal and presentation, I think it's a very interesting uh, different perspective. You, you made some strong statement about uh, DNS, uh, which uh, might uh, open the debate uh, afterwards. But uh, with regard to, to the very specific of the, this project, and, and uh, and um, well, at 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 that project, is there any uh, specific question to Christian from from the audience? I'm looking. Well, I see at... two questions. One is how does the encryption work? I would you know there is uh, some key derivation blinding involved, uh, but you can read that in the draft here, or you can read it uh, in this uh, academic paper how the encryption works. As for the DHT. Uh, you know, as I said, there is some uh, things that possibly could be improved in terms of performance. The, the DHT is randomized. The DHT itself is oblivious, so it doesn't quite know which users it serves. So blocking queries or, or changing queries, they're all signed, so you can't attack it that way. But of course, yes, DHTs, uh, the, the performance characteristics of the DHT are basically then the performance characteristics of the GNU name system. Right. Thanks for these uh, answers. Uh, let's move to the... Oh, Can yes, I? Sorry, Rick. Yes, quick, quickly, because time is running. Yeah, identities. Are those DNS identities? Uh, basically, we would say one zone in the GNU name system is one of your identities. We want to have the right to forgotten, so you can have many zones under your control, but you can use any of the GNS zones as one of your identities. And then by putting records under into your zone, you uh, can provide attributes or attestations or claims or delegate names to other parties. Including users. All users, well, mostly users are, are use, running the zones, is the idea. We want every user to run their own zones. So, okay. like your phone book would be, your, one, would be one of your zones, maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's all encrypted, I suppose. The keys are also encrypted. So, the identities are also encrypted. 
the identities on the network are always encrypted. Of course, if I want to add your identity, I have to kind of learn your public key. But I would not expose your public key to the internet. So the public keys are not public. Yeah, thanks. Lovely. All right, thank you. Uh, now let's move to the last presenter, Jeremy, who is uh, calling from uh, the East Coast, if I'm right. Uh, welcome, Jeremy. is uh, working for the Namecoin effort as an independent. And uh, you will uh, tell us about uh, Namecoin. Please, the floor is yours. All right, great. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm uh, Jeremy from Namecoin, uh, giving this presentation on behalf of our NGI developers, uh, Lola, Jan Mani, and Ahmed. Uh, this talk will be a brief introduction to Namecoin, both high-level design and uh, use cases. Uh, so, uh, Namecoin is a naming system, uh, meaning you can register things like Europa.bit with it. Uh, it has a global namespace, and the names are human meaningful, so in those ways it looks a lot like the DNS. Uh, but uh, unlike the DNS, Namecoin is also decentralized. Uh, so there aren't any trusted third parties who can hijack or otherwise tamper with a name. Uh, under the hood, uh, Namecoin is a fork of Bitcoin. In fact, we were actually the first project forked from Bitcoin way back in 2011. Uh, names in Namecoin look a lot like coins in Bitcoin. Uh, and as a consequence of this, uh, if an attacker wants to steal or hijack uh, someone else's name without possessing their private key, that's uh, comparable in difficulty to uh, stealing bitcoins, uh, so uh, quite difficult. Uh, Namecoin uses the .bit uh, top-level domain, uh, and you need Namecoin installed in order to resolve these domains. So this is conceptually similar to how .onion domains require Tor to be installed. Uh, so uh, one use case uh, for uh, Namecoin is uh, replacing uh, public certificate authorities in the TLS ecosystem. Uh, so, as we all know, TLS depends on public certificate authorities, and if one of those CAs gets compromised, then the attacker can impersonate uh, traffic uh, or, in, or, uh, or intercept traffic. Uh, Namecoin can act as a solution uh, by embedding a TLS public key directly in the domain record on the blockchain. So instead of uh, what normally happens with TLS, where you check whether a public CA has signed a certificate to see if you trust it, uh, with Namecoin, you would just check whether the public key matches what's on the blockchain, so you don't need public CAs anymore. Uh, this is basically the same concept as Dane in the DNS world, uh, but uh, unlike Dane, it is a lot more decentralized. Now, unfortunately, uh, mainstream TLS clients, such as web browsers, don't really have any idea how to validate certificates using Namecoin, and in fact, they don't even generally know how to use Dane. And this is actually a really important problem to solve because lack of mainstream browser support is, I think, the really big reason why almost no one in the real world uses Dane. Uh, and so most of the other projects out there that try to do things with customizing certificate validation, they're mostly using an intercepting proxy for compatibility with mainstream web browsers. Uh, but uh, we do not do that uh, because we don't trust intercepting proxies. We think they have ridiculously high attack surface. Uh, Superfish is probably the best known example of a catastrophe that resulted from an intercepting proxy that uh, was buggy. So uh, because we don't trust intercepting proxies, we've sort of become specialists in uh, other uh, interesting ways of uh, customizing certificate validation in mainstream browsers. Uh, we use approaches that are perhaps less obvious than intercepting proxy, but do have a lot less attack surface. Uh, so, as examples, a few of the APIs and features we use are things like uh, PKCS11 trust objects, uh, name constraints of various types, uh, authority information access, uh, key pinning, things like that. Uh, another use case where Namecoin is uh, well suited is uh, Tor Onion Services. Uh, if anyone's unfamiliar with the details of Tor, Tor has an Onion Services feature that uh, allows uh, anonymous hosting of TCP services such as websites. Uh, Tor is great for privacy. The problem is that the uh, names of these uh, .onion addresses are very, very scary looking base32 encoded public keys. Uh, so uh, you see an example on the slide there, you're probably not going to be able to memorize that. And because you probably can't memorize it, you're probably also not going to carefully check the entire string if you see it in another context. 
and this can make phishing attacks a, re a real problem. Uh, and Namecoin can be a solution to this because Namecoin domains can point to a Tor onion service instead of an IP address. Uh, so uh, this can provide a human meaningful naming layer for onion services. Uh, as an example, uh, federalistpapers.bit uh, is an alias in Namecoin for that scary looking onion that's uh, near the top of the slide there. So uh, we actually integrated Namecoin into Tor. Uh, the implementation we have uh, preserves the anonymity and security properties that you would expect for doing name lookups in Tor. Uh, so everything you would expect to work properly, things like uh, stream isolation, that still works. And the performance actually is pretty good uh, because we optimized the heck out of the software. Uh, for example, it's ready to resolve names within a few seconds after you launch Tor browser. Uh, and our testers say that uh, they can't actually tell the difference in speed between Namecoin-based Onion services and regular .onion websites. Uh, so as an example, uh, here's a screenshot of that uh, Federalist Papers Onion service that's uh, loaded through Namecoin. As you can see, the URL bar shows federalistpapers.bit.onion. Uh, another use case is uh, Zeronet. Uh, if you haven't heard of Zeronet, uh, it's a fairly new protocol. It doesn't have a lot of usage yet. Uh, in terms of use case, uh, Zeronet looks a lot like HTTP. Uh, it's mostly used for browsing websites, not generally for file sharing. Uh, but under the hood, the implementation looks a lot more like BitTorrent. Uh, for example, in Zeronet, there aren't any servers. Uh, the website is served by other visitors. And so this can be more reliable than HTTP because server outages are not really something you need to worry about. Uh, in some cases, it can also be more secure than HTTP because all of the website content is signed. And so there's no applicable concept of an attacker compromising a server and then changing the content there. Uh, and uh, the hash of the uh, public signing key is used as the address of the website. Uh, and ZeroNet supports Tor Onion services as a transport, so it has somewhat better privacy than similar protocols like BitTorrent itself. Uh, and ZeroNet uh, does support Namecoin as a naming layer uh, to get human meaningful aliases for those public key hash addresses. Uh, in fact, they were actually one of the uh, earliest protocols to significantly utilize Namecoin. Uh, now, unfortunately, while ZeroNet does support using a local Namecoin resolver, which is basically trustless. Uh, by default, it does use a centralized Namecoin resolver run by the ZeroNet founder, and this is something we are going to fix because that's not a good situation. Um, uh, relatedly, uh, sort of a, as a general note about Namecoin, uh, I didn't make a slide for this, uh, but uh, since uh, it seems relevant to a lot of the other presentations here, I should note that Namecoin uh, is interoperable with the DNS. So for example, you can delegate from Namecoin to an authoritative DNS name server using NS and DS records, using DNS set keys that you control. Uh, so you can use this to leverage the scalability properties that the DNS has, uh, but uh, you still get most of the security properties that Namecoin has. So Namecoin remains your trust route, uh, so, it, so it doesn't rely on something like, uh, like the uh, ICANN root key or anything like that. Um, so, so I think there's sort of a trend here in terms of uh, adoption trends. Uh, and which types of communities and use cases are more favorable to experimental uh, things such as Namecoin. Uh, one of the earliest adopters was uh, ZeroNet. Uh, they can't use existing tech like the DNS. They don't really have a large user base. Um, and so they can experiment cheaply, uh, and they get a potentially very high reward without a lot of risk. Um, a likely subsequent adopter would be something like Tor. Uh, Tor, of course, is a much larger project than ZeroNet. Their user base is uh, still very averse to the DNS, like the ZeroNet use base. Um, but uh, Tor's user base is much larger, and so Tor needs to tread very carefully to protect that user base. Uh, and so they would, they would uh, naturally be a lot more cautious uh, with Namecoin than something like ZeroNet would be. Uh, and I think a much later category of adoption, at least in terms of being widespread, would be something like the TLS use case. Because, yeah, TLS might benefit from Namecoin, but in a lot of cases, it can maybe also get by just fine with uh, the standard DNS and certificate authority system. And there's a huge amount of inertia uh, that we would have to fight because the TLS ecosystem is already so big. Uh, 
for example, in the TLS world, uh, a lot of website op owners, they might not want to get special name coin certificates that need special software when they can just, you know, use Let's Encrypt and it works out of the box. Whereas the ZeroNet community doesn't have to fight that kind of inertia to do interesting experiments, such as using Namecoin. Now, to be clear, I do think that uh, we can get uh, large-scale adoption of Namecoin for TLS, uh, but it is certainly a uh, bigger challenge. And so the takeaway from this, I think, is that it's not really a requirement or even necessarily feasible for everyone to adopt uh, experimental uh, technologies such as Namecoin all at once. Uh, initial focus can be on niche use cases where uh, where Namecoin can uh, can give a, a very big benefit, and this can be a foothold to getting wider adoption over time. So the uh, specific NGI project objectives that uh, we have are threefold. Uh, number one, uh, we are going to uh, overhaul the Namecoin usage in ZeroNet. Uh, we're going to be enhancing both the security and the UX of that. I mentioned earlier, ZeroNet currently uses a centralized resolver by default. That is horrible, in my opinion. That's one of our top priorities to fix there. Uh, we've also had conversations with a number of GNU Linux distros who have basically said, uh, yeah, we would be happy to install uh, Namecoin and maybe even enable it by default but uh, we would need you to do the packaging work yourself. And so we're doing that. We're packaging Namecoin for uh, some of those distros. And uh, NGI is also funding uh, a bunch of enhancements to the uh, core blockchain and wallet code. Uh, these are enhancements for security, performance, and UX. So uh, that is our presentation. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for inviting us to the session. Huge thanks to NGI and NLNet for uh, supporting development. Uh, these are RPGP fingerprints. Feel free to copy this down if you want to triangulate later. Uh, happy to uh, uh, take questions. It looks like there are some questions that are in uh, the chat already. Uh, if you want me to look through those, or, or, or uh, to what extent do you guys want me to uh, answer those now? Well, there was one question about, uh, about stealing bitcoins and the, and the question of the physical management of the keys, but I think you just mentioned that uh, the, within NGI, there is a funding for helping uh, uh, human interface, and is it is it expanding to wallets or uh, key management? Um. Yes. Yeah, so let's see. Um. So the general uh, approach that we take there is because Namecoin is a fork of Bitcoin, and because Bitcoin has by far a larger development community than we have. What we tend to do is, for things such as key management workflows, uh, we tend to uh, rely on the uh, Bitcoin community to do innovations there, and then we pretty much get those innovations for free. Um, Christian is absolutely correct that uh, that the state of key management for, uh, uh, for Bitcoin is certainly not optimal. Uh, and, you know, th there's obviously a lot of work that needs to go into that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, th th I would say there definitely has been a lot of improvement over the past mm -hmm. few years, and I expect that to keep improving. Um, I should also note that um, because uh, Bitcoin has a lot of uh, smart contract support built in, which Namecoin inherits for free, you can actually uh, get some uh, some fairly interesting uh, trust models in Namecoin that uh, that. Uh, do, that do a lot of risk limiting in terms of things like he's getting stolen. Uh, mm -hmm. as, as one example, um, uh, it's possible to have uh, uh, commercial businesses such as, uh, that basically look sort of like registrars. You can have those with Namecoin in such a way where uh, where the registrar would, main would maintain one set of keys, the user would maintain another set of keys, and the registrar would have to uh, co-sign uh, transactions. Uh, that update uh, a name, and so uh, and so that would uh, limit uh, the impact of just the user having their keys compromised, things like that. Um, and uh, th there are actually a number of uh, of uh, of of uh, specific uh, implementations of that kind of thing that exist in in the Bitcoin world right now. Uh, one of them is called uh, Blockstream Green. Another is called Trusted Coin. And uh, protocols like that could fairly easily be implemented on top of Namecoin as well. Right. Um, 
Yeah. Well, or, uh, or, or any, any, any other questions I should answer now, or should we move uh, Well, on? there was this question on uh, ENS. Uh, what would you how would you compare? Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of things that I am concerned about with ENS, but uh, the biggest one is that uh, ENS actually uh, has a uh, backdoor. Uh, uh, basically, um, so and this was actually confirmed by one of the ENS developers at uh, at an ICANN meeting uh, a couple years ago. Uh, basically, uh, uh, Paul Vouders uh, asked the uh, the ENS developer, uh, uh, "Hey, uh, if if someone has a name that we think we should uh, be able to uh, take control of, is there any way for us to seize that domain?" And the ENS developer basically said, uh, "Yes, uh, there's actually a, there, there's actually a centralized mechanism to do that, uh, where basically you have to convince four out of seven Ethereum developers uh, to seize a domain for you, uh, which I which I think is horrifying because, uh, like, if if you're already uh, just reducing the security properties to uh, four of seven multisig." At that point, you don't actually even need a blockchain. You can get a similar security model just using uh, standard, uh, uh, you know, Shamir secret sharing uh, 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 with uh, DNS, and uh, and so yeah. But the fact that ENS decided to put in a backdoor, I think, completely nukes their credibility. Namecoin does not have any such mechanism. Uh, with Namecoin, if if you if you own a name then there's no mechanism for, for the Namecoin developers or anyone else to steal it from you. Okay. We trust you on that, of course. Uh, thanks for this. Thanks for the, all the presenters. Maybe, uh, Mikael, you can go back to the, 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 the main uh, uh, screen. Um, so uh, we have a, a bit of time for, well, we already pan, uh, have a panel discussion because uh, I see from the public chat as well as uh, uh, discussion that occurred that, that a lot of uh, questions were already uh, taken on board. But uh, let's uh, open the floor for uh, for questions to the panel. Uh, anyone want to start? So we cover quite a, a range of uh, of topics and and issues. Uh, well, one of the one of of the key issue that was mentioned was the concentration, both on, on the browsers and uh, the certificate side. Is there any uh, is there any comments there? I see somebody that uh, uh, Christian uh, Christian, you want to to say something? Um, well, not really. I just try, but basically I do have a question, so why not take it right now? Um, so we've seen a few different approaches on the topic of. Um, Take your uh, registering names and having the cryptographic identifiers kind of redirecting to cryptographic identifiers. Is there any route you see towards having some kind of split there, or saying that basically things like Namecoin or the say higher layers of the new name system um, converge on having having a handoff point where they would then let kind of spit out some cryptographic identifier with which you could then go on, find the connection, however that is done, kind of introduce some layer there where we could have more interoperability? Yeah, good question. That's, uh, no, see, that's already kind of almost a political question because technically, of course, you can put GNS public keys into the eth Ethereum or uh, Namecoin name system. Just like with GNS, you can have registrars like uh, dot, uh, .fr or so uh, allowing you to register names and then they put your public key into their database right so all of these different models if it's i put you into my personal address book i have an organization that allows you to register for money or i have a blockchain that allows you to register all of these are uh, in principle possible that's a question of social choice but in terms of the cryptography the gns can be integrated with any of them right and any of them you know even dns you can put in a gns record Right, just define a record type. Okay, have fun with CITF doing that one. But in principle, you can put DNS into GNS, GNS into DNS. The records, you can point to them. That's not a problem. Uh, it's just a question of making the technology happen. Then the question is what society kind of wants. Do they want, a, a, let's say, a bit uh, uh, energy inefficient uh, blockchain to manage uh, the root zone? Do we want a 
political uh, multi-stakeholder, nobody is responsible organization to run the root zone for us? Or do we want to have a commercial application that basically goes and says, oh, we're going to take you, charge you lots and lots of money for having keeping your name, uh, uh, run our names. Those are social questions. Uh, but I think on the on the cryptography side, GNS can support any of them. Mm -hmm. Mikiel, do you hint that uh, connect by name could be used also for that? Well, the suggestion I, that I was making is that uh, you don't want all the developers to take the responsibility for upgrading it. Eric mechanism where where somebody that says I want to connect to that user and then let uh, in alternative resolution mechanisms and all kinds of additional assurances be handled by some backend service like Connect by Name. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So maybe yeah, indeed. Um, uh, maybe I can comment on that. So uh, Michiel and I and, and, and we yes, have discussed this also at the start of the project. So uh, we, can, we can't do everything, of course, within the project. So first of all, we looked at how, well, we resolve a name, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, that indeed triggered us thinking about, well, the name resolution that can be, well, let's call it the global DNS as we know it, or something else. And that's indeed the modeler that, that uh, the, the naming resolution could be also another system than the global DNS. Yeah. Thank you for this comment. Uh, there is a, a question. Uh, Jeremy, you want to take the floor? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I have a question uh, uh, mostly uh, directed to Alexander, although anyone else who has thoughts is welcome to answer as well. Um, I think it would be really interesting to talk about uh, uh, the specific use case of using uh, DOT or DOH uh, for the communication between a recursive resolver and an authoritative name server, and specifically how that might interact with Namecoin. And this is a use case that's really important for Namecoin, because typically Namecoin users are running a recursive resolver locally uh, and uh, and uh, Namecoin can delegate uh, specific uh, Namecoin domain names to authoritative name servers via NS and DS records and so we rely on a local recursive resolver uh, to, uh, to do that. Um, and unfortunately, the side effect of this is that right now the ecosystem for doing DOT or DOH for that communication that the local recursive resolver makes to those authoritative name servers, there's there's really no ecosystem support for that right now, as far as I can tell. Uh, and that's unfortunate because that means that in practice, Namecoin users who are accessing uh, 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 that kind of uh, 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 data, it, there's a lot of uh, unencrypted data that gets leaked that way. Uh, discovery should be very straightforward in this case because the Namecoin blockchain can simply specify that uh, you know th that this particular authoritative uh, name server uh, supports DOT or DOH or whatever. So it seems like discovery might be easier than the general uh, DNS case. And so I'm curious, uh, just sort of, uh, w what your thoughts are on that? Yeah, maybe. Sorry, I'm I, I'm not sure if I understand correctly why you think it will be simpler, or because you know which authoritative server you will be connecting to. Is that what you're um, saying? Well, so so it sounded sounded from your slides like uh, like there was a discovery issue of keeping track of uh, of which um, of things like uh, which authoritative name servers support DOT or DOH, and for that matter, things like uh, <coughs> uh, make, making sure that. Uh, that the uh, that that say the TLS fingerprint is known in advance. Namecoin can put that data in the blockchain directly, so that seems like it might be uh, a simpler case. I'm not sure though. Curious what your take is. Is I think the the, so the problem is that you don't know upfront which authoritative server you will end up with, so you cannot choose that. So. Right. So, 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 it, so, so the Namecoin blockchain can list a specific authoritative name server uh, uh, for a given uh, .bit domain, uh, and so, uh, the, and so the recursive resolver uh, can can figure out uh, from that which which authoritative name server it needs to contact in order to get the records for a particular .bit domain. Uh, right. If, if I'm understanding but, but, you correctly. But, 
but the, yeah, yes, but the way you are saying it, that means that the information that you that you are searching for is already present, right? In the uh, already... yes, yes. So, so, so the information on what authoritative name server you need to contact and how to contact them that would be that would already be available in the Namecoin blockchain. <clears throat> and so, the only thing that you would need to do is 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 make sure that you uh, use DOT or DOH accordingly. For, for contacting that authoritative name server when you actually want to look up the data that it has. Right. Yes. So I, I yeah I've been in trouble of of seeing the diff because of course if you know it then it then it's clear that if you know that it, TLS is that aggression is supported then it helps because you can support it over you can connect to it over TLS but that, that is not in right. general a, the case I would say but it can right. be for specific ones right 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 so 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 I guess so I guess what I'm wondering is. Given that, given that that particular uh, barrier isn't a, isn't really a problem for Namecoin's use cases, uh, uh, I, I guess I'm just wondering: would that make it uh, simpler or more straightforward uh, to have that uh, that DOT or DOH uh, connection yes. between the yeah, okay, yes, and the encryption itself is? Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, there are a lot of. I mean, it still has to be standardized. A lot of ideas on how to do that, but I think that is being. Uh, yeah, there are no big blockers there, so that is the easier okay. part, I would say. Great. Okay, that's it. that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for this iteration. Um, sh shall we move to uh, other questions? Uh, I see from uh, the list the chat that uh, Thomas has a, has a question. Thomas, do you want to express your question? Well. Uh, the question is, do I get right that ODNS and DOH do not really enhance privacy because the big resolver still can see all the data? Was there anybody uh, that wants to answer this question? Well, well, yeah, maybe, of course, to start with, with DOH. Um, DOH sends the DNS query over HTTPS, but in the end, the resolver, where it ends, has to start resolving that um, that query, and it indeed can see the query. So the only thing is that when it leaves the resolver, it can do another layer of encryption. But the resolver, yes, in the case of DOH, can see the uh, can see the actual request. Yeah. Uh -huh. But yes. that is why it is important, for example, that if you uh, choose to trust a resolver, that preferably it's one that you you choose for another reason apart from that it's the one that is the default coming with your browser. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, if I can, in, in addition to that, thank you, Alexander. Um, so DOH as a, as a protocol is not very different. Well, it's, this is really <laughs> generalizing and, and very high level view. It's not very different from DOT. Only the, the deployment model is quite different. And that's uh, what triggered a lot of discussion here. Uh, it's different from what we are used to see uh, the deployment model, indeed, in DOH is that not the system decides where your query is forwarded to, which resolver, but the application, uh, read Chrome, Firefox, uh, Safari, yeah. and and that triggered a lot of discussion. And how can we it, can we trust the decision of the application developer to forward all my queries to? Now, for now, uh, one of the Quad uh, X uh, uh, name resolvers, or indeed, and that's the whole discussion in ADD also in the ITF working group. How do we discover? How do we? How does the application? Uh, how do we extend this that it can discover <coughs> other DOH servers in an ISP? And then uh, if it's, it's forward to an ISP DOH server, it's not much different from a DOT's uh, name yeah. server. There, there are many facets here. There are many facets, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. Thomas, is that, is that what you meant? He cannot, uh, he cannot oh, mention, he can. but, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, he has a, an, an audio problems, but. Uh, yes, can let, you hear let, me now? Ah, yes, yes. Thomas, we hear yes. you, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so I think um, um, yes, I, I get the point that in in the end you uh, you have to trust on the resolver, uh, but I was wondering whether with, for example, oblivious DOH, uh, oblivious DNS, you could have new 
technologies to to get the IP address must, uh, masked on the user level even and you, if you do a query. So it doesn't get out. It, I, I, maybe this is contradictory because <laughs> you need an IP, IP address to redirect your answer back to the user. But well, other ways, yeah. Yeah. I think that what Oblivious DNS is trying to do is indeed having a proxy that, that basically uh, 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 make sure it removes the IP address of the originator. Um, Places with a public key of the originator. I'm sorry. Being replaced with a public key of the originator, so I don't track you by IP but by public key. Yay! Great win. Yeah, because in the end it has to keep track of of uh, because then it sends the anonymous question further and then it gets the answer back and it still has to know. Uh, who who to ultimately send the answer back to, right? No, but it could use a transient or an ephemeral public key, but it doesn't. That's not specified. Yeah, maybe. So I'm not uh, so into technical, but you could, of course, have some interface in which uh, um, it can uh, uh, a third party or somebody between mix mix the translation to the IP address in the end with. Uh, with a key or otherwise. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, just to point out, in, in contrast, in the GNU name system, you know, uh, of course, you might want to hide the IP address by going over a proxy like Tor. But in the end, since you don't know what the question or the answer was, there is much less of a need to obscure the, the query because the query is encrypted. And it remains encrypted. OK, thanks. Right. Um, we are reaching the limit of this call. Uh, maybe just to uh, wrap it up, uh, if each of the panelists could tell uh, what uh, they think are the important next steps uh, for the future in terms of uh, naming technology. Uh, we have heard, for instance, about concentration in browser, in, in certificates. We have heard about interoperability. Uh, between different uh, technologies, we've have heard, uh, we have not heard about scalability actually, because uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the DNS is a massive, uh, massively used uh, infrastructure. So uh, it, we have uh, heard about, of course, resilience and, and, and so what uh, what could be the the important next challenge to be solved in this uh, uh, environment? Anyone want to to hint something? Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I have a brief thought. Um, uh, just I, th I think uh, my take is that uh, a lot of the work that uh, that gets done in this field, especially for more experimental things uh, like Namecoin, and, I, and I, I'm guessing also for GNU Name System, uh, a major source of uh, headache is just that uh, mainstream uh, uh, web browsers and operating systems and other stuff that that uh, users use just is not really designed to support this kind of experimentation very uh, smoothly. Um, and you know, I mean, obviously, I'm I'm kind of proud of the fact that Namecoin works as well as it does without any cooperation from browser vendors. But at the same time, I think a lot of this kind of work would move forward a lot faster if if it were more easy uh, for end users to uh, to experiment with this kind of thing without constantly. Uh, running into problems w w with you know things like missing APIs or just general uh, general deployment headaches where, um, where where the uh, where where you have to do you know crazy hacks to make things uh, uh, integrate with existing software. Mm -hmm. Good point. Uh, I agree with that. We also have for the, for reclaim uh, and the GNU name system. We also have some rather crazy hacks to enable integration. Uh, but if you have done those crazy hacks, for example, with reclaim and the OpenID Connect adapter. It's you know that we have a browser plugin that basically creates you know an open ID connect on your local machine for your own uh, uh, decentralized identity provider. So it can be done, but yeah, the browser vendors, especially the changing web extension APIs, can be a nightmare. And often they don't expose TLS details that we would like to have access to, and then they say, oh, but you can't touch the TLS stack from JavaScript. Yeah, that, that's a mess. I totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the TLS, very yeah, much the TLS ecosystem in particular is horrible there, yeah. 
the the, the web system I, I had a few discussion on the HTTP BIS group and it's quite obvious that HTTP is an old protocol has a lot of backlog they're trying to be compatible even with things that somebody might have done even though it's against the standards that have ever been written um, a next generation to get away from HTTP at least the 1.1 or the slash 2 which probably functionally equivalent um, to have the courage to say we're going to abandon the old HTTP protocols we're going to start again that would give a lot of fresh air to the HTTP specification and to the browser manufacturer because the browser manufacturers are facing this complexity and um, don't know how how this could move on it's it's pretty much it's so old it's really gotten tied in it's like it's like a dense ball of strong dependencies that people rely on and that needs to be broken down the web right. is the biggest problem of progress on the internet yeah well that's uh, maybe a topic for another webinar um any other uh, benoit yes. under uh, benoit yeah yeah it's uh, so within the ITF standards, so uh, back back where I'm coming from here. Um, so what I think, what I foresee eh, the, in the near future is need the, the discovery is very important. So yeah. what's the, the ITF uh, ADD working group? So how do I discover indeed for DNS uh, over TLS uh, to authorities, authorities, we d briefly discussed it also in the context of the question of uh, Jeremy and answered by uh, Alexander. So how do we discover uh, DOT and uh, well, uh, enabled uh, name servers, authoritative name servers, but also at the bottom end or at the start of my query, how do browsers, application discover resolvers that support certain features like uh, DOT, DOH or other things and that's that's building our, our complete trust in our infrastructure because if we can kind of build a trust infra, a trusted infrastructure with TLS authenticated TLS from my application to my resolver and from a re resolver to the authoritative name server I think that's a big win and uh, that's I think is one of the things we or I uh, but also we in general in the ITF and at our company are thinking of yeah, absolutely. Propagating uh, trust and discovering yeah. and trusted parties. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we have a, a small parenthesis. We have a project called NGI Zero Discovery. So that might be uh, an opportunity to explore things in that context. Uh, anyone else? Uh, I think uh, Alexander or Leif, uh, do you yeah, want to? I agree with the discovery part, of course, that was just mentioned. And in addition, I, I still are, I know that there are all these more long-term things uh, that we also heard about, about a lot today, but on the relatively short term, I think it is important that we have, let's say, European trusted resolvers before moving all the traffic uh, away, because it's very hard to get people switching back, I think, once, uh, once, once they were forced or lured into using other other resolvers. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, I'm I'm um, uh, contacting Leif. I think he was uh, busy with other things, as he mentioned himself. So, well, if we don't hear back from him, it means that uh, uh, we we have to we have reached uh, all our panelists. Uh, and anything. Anybody wants to say something from Commission or no? Right. Uh, let's. I think we have made a, a large uh, and deep survey of the current stages of, of this technology and explore both. Uh, well, explore consolidation of this technology, expanding it and uh, and identifying a new technology trends. This uh, this is very interesting, and we have also, uh, from Commission point of view, hints for for the next challenges or next steps. Uh, this uh, webinar will be uh, published uh, for external parties, so feel free to uh, to exchange it uh, further to anybody interested. And uh, the presentation will be also posted online. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, uh, Mikkel, for uh, supporting this, uh, as well as all other uh, research and innovation action. And uh, well, with that, uh, I wish you a, a very good end of the day. Thank you, everyone.
Hey, thanks for organizing. And, uh, Welcome. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.